piece of liberalism. So I was just trying to throw a little bit in how walls maybe also are instituting or marking sites of political struggle, in this case often by the dominant powers, or at least the ones that like to see them as dominant territorialising powers. <coughs> Okay, thank you. We'll take one more and then ask your okay, responses. Not too Engel. many more. I'm too old. No, Engel. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is the last one. No, no, I mean, I'll do it all day, but I just can't hold more than three yeah, at once yeah. in my head. <laughs> Um, thanks, Wendy, and, and thanks for the discussions as well, just uh, laying out really a uh, wonderful set of issues to think uh, through. Um, I have just two quick observations, uh, Wendy, about uh, a, a way of approaching the wall, maybe slightly from a different angle that you may have already explored in the book, uh, but just want to see if, if you have reactions to that. One comes from... Um, Lewis Mumford and his thoughts on the wall. He, he struggles through in the early chapters of the city in history, um, the, differentiating uh, the wall, the medieval wall, from what he considers as authoritarian, absolutist, um, oriental kingdoms before uh, the Greek or Roman uh, power, and tries to sort of make sense of what that meant uh, for the political order. And he makes one observation and he says, you know, after years and years of thinking about this thing and being really bothered by the presence of the wall, I've come to the conclusion that the wall is not about the outside. It's not a symbol of what it's trying to keep out, but it is about reminding those who are inside what is potentially in the outside. So it is really about the inside, but the inside is reminded by the presence of the wall that what, what is valuable about the inside. And I was thinking of that, you know, especially when you said, uh, well, it actually it doesn't work. It doesn't function in the way in which it proposes its function. It cannot keep out. <laughs> Therefore, the spectacular and the theatrical aspect of the wall, what does it say about... Um, what is inside? What is the value of citizenship inside? What is that which being valorized as citizenship or, or being inside? I wonder if there is something to be uh, explored there. The second observation comes from um, Zizek's book, Tarrying with the Negative. And there is a chapter there, Enjoy Your Nation. And he develops this psychoanalytical concept of uh, enjoyment with respect to nation. And he has this phrase that what is really about uh, the hatred of the other is about is that the other is stealing my enjoyment. And it is this notion of stealing of the enjoyment that I potentially have with safe uh, life, with secure life, wealth life, and so on. So I wonder if there's something to be made there as well, that this, this, this wall, given that it cannot really fulfill its function, it's fulfilling another function that is not as visible. And whether Mumford and Zizek observations can actually enter another way into that, what you call the paradox. Okay, Wendy. <laughs> you don't have to do them all. No. <laughs> But they're all interesting. So, um, and I would I would also love to see if our other interlocutors have some ideas about them as well. So, um, first to your question, uh, I think inverting the thesis that I've suggested, which is that walls symptomatize uh, a certain erosion in. Now I'm going to have to qualify it a hundred ways after the two. Uh, 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 gentle criticisms of my formulation of sovereignty. But let me, let me just hang to the thesis for a second. If walls signify a certain erosion of uh, sovereign power, then is the absence of walls uh, a, a certain sign of strength? In the formulation of sovereignty that I have offered, I would accept that absolutely because what I'm suggesting is that settled sovereignty, and here I think I come a little closer to Raya than maybe this paper would indicate. Um, which is that accepting the notion that, that sovereignty in its uh, settled 
everyday quotidian stable function is precisely not expressing itself as supremacist, as emergency, as decisionist, and so forth. It simply expresses itself through the ordinary obtainment of order and authority uh, and uh, a certain degree of, of, of law-abiding life. And, and that's, how, that, that, that's how sovereignty, you know, when Hobbes gives us his infamous formulation of, of the sovereign, out of all of that terror and fear that is mobilized to, to, to get us there, we are not then, um, I think, in my reading of Hobbes, understood as living in an ordinary, everyday way with, with that kind of specter of sovereignty, but rather with the sheer pleasure or just ordinary satisfaction of sovereignty working, which is to say, stable, orderly society which means you don't need walls. It means you don't need fortification. It means you don't need hyper-policing. It means you don't need um, the kinds of, of, uh, of vigilance or vigilantism that um, dapples late modern life. So um, yes, you and I are in perfect accord. I don't think you and I are in perfect accord with my two interlocutors, but I'm going to leave uh, Milton Keynes soon and leave you to them. So, <laughs> Okay. So um, walls as sites of political struggle. Yes, that was uh, exactly... Uh, where, where was that question coming from? Yes, thank you, Jeff. Um, uh, ag again, uh, in, in other parts of the book, I try to elaborate this much more, that um, they do indeed represent that, uh, but in the sense that they represent a kind of um, permanence of, of political struggle, uh, even as many walls are often built officially under the sign of impermanence, and nothing is, is, is more striking in that respect than the wall in Israel. Um, which is always elaborated as a temporary structure, uh, precisely to avoid the accusation that it is redrawing boundaries or that it is a permanent kind of prison for either side or anything else. It is a temporary security measure. But the very fact of the mortar and the bricks and the steel and the billions and billions of dollars that go into the most elaborate walls suggests that it's anything but, or at least that its temporariness uh, stands in a sort of striking paradoxical relationship um, to its materiality. But I do agree that they are sites of political struggle and need to be read as screens, important screens, texts of political struggle. What I'm suggesting is that one political struggle they represent, and this will bring us to the next set of questions. One, one set of political struggles they represent is a struggle against many of the effects of globalization in the name of certain nationalisms and in the names of certain nationalisms that cannot actually be gratified economically or culturally or religiously but which the walls then serve to um, figure or prop uh, at a kind of psychic social political level. So yes, they're political struggles, and sometimes they're literal political struggles about immigration or about drug traffic or about terrorism or about, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're elaborated as civilizational struggles sometimes as well. Um, or, or they're elaborated as colonial struggles or post-colonial struggles. But um, what I'm suggesting is that we should not read them simply as strategies or tactics or fortifications in relationship to actual struggles, but also to uh, national imaginaries and identities. I'm going to hit all the terms. Uh, and notions <laughs> of citizenship. <laughs> I'm going to get governance in a second. <laughs> um, that, 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 um, that, that cannot actually... Uh, uh, in which there is no possible victory on either side, and and and, and because because they actually represent a, a struggle that is a is a, a struggle with the problematic of globalization, given.